Okay, so we just did the pacemaker cells or autorhythmic cells. Um, I'm going to recommend one more time that you guys watch this because this goes through the pacemaker cells and the contractile cells. So now what I want to talk about is the um, cardiac muscle cells that actually contract, that actually act more like a typical muscle cells. These are called the contractile cardiac muscle cells. And so um, this will really pull in a lot of your membrane potential stuff and um, contraction stuff from skeletal muscle. So I want to talk about the mechanism of excitation contraction, which is how you get from an action potential to contraction um, in a cardiac muscle cell. So um, notice, of course, that these are striated, which should give you an inclination that there's probably actin and myosin involved in there, even though it is in smooth muscle and they're not striated. Okay, so let's look at a cardiac muscle action potential graph. Okay, so what's going to happen is the cardiac muscle... Um, contractile cell will just be sitting there minding its own business, right? And then all of a sudden it will get flooded with sodium and calcium from its neighbor. Let's say its neighbor was a pacemaker cell. It doesn't have to be, but let's say its neighbor was a pacemaker cell. It will re relieve this depolarize, receive this depolarizing stimulus sort of all at once as sodium and calcium are going through the gap junctions, not from the extracellular fluid, but from the neighbor. Um, and this will cause the opening of what we call a fast voltage gated um, sodium channel. Okay, fast voltage gated sodium channel. Um, and it's going to cause that to open, which will get you an action potential from zero to action potential in one fell swoop in the cardiac muscle um, contractile cells. So then the um, action potential will be started. So let's show you this picture and we'll come back to this one. So this looks really familiar because it's really similar to the way that they presented um, skeletal muscle action potentials in, um, in your textbook. So first thing that happened is the current, the, uh, the ions go through the gap junctions into the contractile cell. But then once they get into the contractile cell, they are going to go and start an action potential, right? But it doesn't have to stay on the surface because um, uh, cardiac muscle contractile cells also have T-tubules. So it's going to go down into the cardiac muscle contractile cell via the T-tubule. Okay, so it's going to move down the T-tubule and it's going to cause the release of calcium from the SR of the cardiac muscle cell, just like it did before in skeletal muscle. And then kind of the same thing is going to occur. So um, it is going to go bind to troponin and remove tropomyosin and allow for contraction. But before we get into that, I want to tell you that there's actually one other thing that goes on as you go through there. The action potential on its way across the cell membrane is going to cause the opening of a new kind of channel. And these are called slow voltage gated calcium channels. Um, and the slow voltage gated calcium channels will allow calcium to come into the cell from the extracellular fluid. So now I've got calcium from two different sources. I've got calcium coming in from the extracellular fluid and SR calcium being released. Okay, that calcium, all of that calcium is going to go find itself a troponin, right, and move tropomyosin out of the way. And then once that occurs, assuming that we have oxygen, we can start to do crossbridge cycling. Okay, so we're going to do crossbridge cycling. So this is how you initiate contraction in a skeletal muscle cell. Okay, so what we're going to have to do after that is we're going to have to put everything back where we got it. So, and we'll label this in a figure in just a second. So we're going to have to um, close the sodium channels, close the um, calcium channels, these channels, close any kind of channel that we opened to generate our action potential, which would include voltage gated sodium channels and these voltage gated calcium channels. And then um, we're going to have to repolarize. And I'll bet you guys won't be surprised that we're going to use potassium to repolarize. And then we're going to have to pump everything back where we got it. Primarily how you think we're going to do it, plus a couple of extra little pumps. So during repolarization, calcium is pumped back into the SR, back into the ECF, and the skeletal muscle cell relaxes. So what I want to do is I want to show you on a figure that's like this and also like this, where these things occur. Okay, so... I go from a resting membrane potential of in cardiac muscle contractile cells, resting membrane potential is around minus 90, 
and then I go immediately to this fast depolarization phase. Do you remember what kind of channel caused that? So the depolarizing stimulus, the sodium and calcium that I received from the neighbors, goes through the gap junctions and causes fast voltage-gated sodium channels to open. That's all fast voltage-gated sodium channels. And then you briefly start repolarization, but then um, what happens is your voltage-gated um, calcium channels, which are the slow ones, those are going to open right then, and they are going to prolong the action potential and also increase the amount of calcium that is present in the sarcomere. So um, that is why they're called slow, because they weren't the first ones to open, right? So I had sodium channels first and then I had slow voltage gated calcium channels and the objective of the slow voltage gated calcium channels is to prolong the amount, prolong the action potential so you get a long action potential and increase the amount of calcium so you'll get a strong contraction. Okay, so that is slow voltage gated calcium channels. And then when I'm really done, I want to repolarize. This will be voltage gated potassium channels back to resting membrane potential. So let's get all of that labeled here. So let's do that. Uh -uh. Okay, so what kind of channels do we have here? That guy right there is voltage gated sodium. These are fast. And then right here, the plateau is because of slow voltage gated calcium channels. Okay. And then the repolarization that goes here is voltage gated potassium channels. Okay. Then, um, even though it doesn't show on the picture, we do have to put everything back where we got it. So let's go back to this figure. Okay, so putting everything back where we got it when we actually want to relax. I'm going to have to pump calcium back into the SR because I got it from there. I'm going to have to pump calcium back into the um, extracellular fluid because I got it from there. And I'm going to have to use the sodium potassium pump not shown here. And this one actually shows you a new kind of pump. I don't usually ask you about this, but there is actually a sodium calcium pump, but you're also pumping potassium back out there as well. Okay, so last little tidbit here is just to talk about the refractory period. So cardiac muscle cell does not want to have tetanic contractions. Whenever it contracts, it wants to contract fully, um, not like, the same strength every time, but never weakly. So you want your cardiac muscle never to go, eh, you want it to go, mm, or, ah. okay. So how do we prevent tetanic contractions and summation in cardiac muscle cells? Well, if you have a really long absolute refractory period before those voltage gated ion channels reset, then you can't add what is happening to um, the next time because you're still in absolute refractory period. So um, the refractory period for cardiac muscle cells is around 250 milliseconds for those voltage gated ion channels to re reset compared to one to two milliseconds in skeletal muscle. So you don't get that additive calcium release causing um, like um, a summation. So unlike skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle has really no capacity for summation in a healthy heart and therefore there's no tetanus possible because you've got such a long absolute refractory period that the cell is still in absolute refractory period and you can't uh, make it work again. And that is really good because we all know of course that heart contraction is important because that is generating blood flow. But heart relaxation is also really important. If you're thinking about your ventricles, your ventricles have to be relaxed in order for them to fill. But in addition, um, I'm not sure if you've ever um, thought about this before, but um, when the ventricles contract and they actually push blood into the arteries, including the coronary arteries, right? And the coronary arteries will give blood to the heart from the outside in. So if the left ventricle contracts and pushes blood into the aorta and the coronary arteries, other places too, but let's focus on the heart. You're pushing blood into the arteries, but you are compressing the capillaries in the ventricles. OK, 
Okay, so you got blood to the arteries, but you didn't get it to the capillaries. What do you have to do in order for the capillaries to take it up? You have to relax the heart. So it's kind of like squishing a sponge underwater. Does it actually take up the water when you've squished it? Or do you have to wait until you relax your hand for it to take up the water? So heart relaxation is not only just important for chamber filling, but it's also really important for delivering blood supply to the myocardium and the capillaries of the heart. Next topic is cardiac output.